all week we'll be looking at the people and companies behind the aircraft, but we begin today with a posh voice. Rotate. All's going well. She's airborne. Zero, zero, 002 flies well ahead of the predicted time. More than 30 years on from that test flight here at Filton in the west of England, Concorde is still a symbol of exclusivity and free enterprise. It's ironic, therefore, that the only way it got off the ground was to rely on some very old-fashioned state support. In fact, it was too big a project even for the British government. The only way the plane got off the ground was for the British and French to work together. They signed an agreement, a Concordat, to jointly build a supersonic plane. This was the time of great prestige projects and the um, big prestige, the ultimate prestige project at that time was the, um, uh, the Americans and the Russians fighting over who was going to be first in space um, with putting a dog up there, uh, putting a man up there and then eventually getting a man on the moon. So th there was this great fight going on and Europe was sitting there feeling rather out of it. And Concord happened to be something which uh, Europe succeeded in doing um, and America tried to do and failed. Uh, and, and what's more, um, it has had an amazing legacy. If it were not for the fact that Concord had been built and that, that literally the other, in the other sense, Concord, um, the, the British and French learned how to get on with each other technologically, we would not have Airbus today. Concord is technologically advanced, but even before it was finished, it had become an economic dinosaur. It burns fuel three times faster than a modern Airbus. It was designed in a period when oil was cheap, but in the 70s, oil prices rocketed and nobody wanted to buy this plane. The truth is it now makes a running profit, but that's only if you ignore all of the development costs. And it works because a few people are willing to pay a fortune to fly on it. But as the planes get older, there are more and more issues. The main reason why they're ditching the aircraft now is that it's getting old. Now, that doesn't mean you can't keep it running safely, but the big, the big thing is you can't keep it operating reliably. They're beginning to get problems with it, and problems mean that halfway through your journey you have to divert to somewhere rather unromantic like Halifax. You can't do that to Concorde passengers. You can't ask them to pay um, £8,000 for a ticket and then you know, divert them to Halifax. And when they were paying for a three and a half hour trip, they get there after the subsonic airplane arrives. It's not the most glamorous of locations. It's an old brick building at the end of a runway. But this is where British Airways keep their historic documents and the Concorde memorabilia. And it's run by some retired BA staff who are keen to keep their hand in. You've got a, a selection of menus here from Concorde, haven't you? What oh, sort indeed. of stuff do, did they serve? Well, this is the, one of them from the uh, early flights, and they were serving things like uh, Parma ham and uh, right. Maine lobster. And what I like is this um, in-flight shopping uh, magazine, which is distinctly posher than the stuff I'm used to. Uh, huge amounts of gold and things here. People actually buy this. They do indeed, and a lot of it as well. Wow, look at that. A schroncy thing to take home for your holiday. And would you, would you buy one? What we've got here is uh, sort of effectively, I think, well, are some log books. Now, this is the average load factors. It goes back to September 77. Um, going, coming back is a lot fuller than going out. Actually, going out is sometimes only 30% full. It goes up to 80% full going, uh, coming back. We've got Air France, which uh, unfortunately looks rather busier. Uh, Air France looks a bit busier than... Uh, than the British Airways Concorde. And also, what I think is really interesting, is just how reliable the aircraft has been. Um, down to about 90%, overall about 93% reliable uh, during 1978. What have we got here? Useful, useful hints on the service of drinks. Check that glasses are clear and not chipped. Good, good scheme. Ha good. Handle glasses by the stems, place the glass on a drip mat, always, always garnish squashes with a slice of orange. Well. And they've paid 
what was it, £45 or something? Well, they're, they're asking for a lot. Always use they? cocktail sticks, not fingers. Keep the bar working space clean and tidy. Remember, a drink should please the eye as well as the palate. Isn't that fantastic? It is. It's more than a manual on Concord. It's a way of life. It's a way of life. Mm. Absolutely right. Concord creates a priceless halo effect for British Airways. Its most frequent flyers have been rich Americans who've used Concord to fly the Atlantic and then stayed with British Airways in first class to fly on to other places. Without Concord, British Airways must hope they'll retain those passengers using their first class seats. They certainly don't want the likes of Virgin buying Concord and nicking their most lucrative passengers. All this week we're focusing on the people behind Concorde and the part they've played in the uh, in the plane's history, the men and women behind the machine. Um, just to sort of leaven our coverage a little bit, we got an email from Cathy Whitehead. She says, can somebody tell me why we're celebrating a multi-billion pound economic disaster which the government ultimately just gave away, benefiting only the super rich, when the rest of us are condemned to travelling on cattle trucks because there's been no investment of any note in our railway system for the last 40 years? That comes from Cathy Whitehead. She brackets, she says, grumpy old woman. Cathy, not a bit of this. You're welcome. Thanks very much for that. Anyway, fascinating facts. Uh, there have been more American astronauts than there have been British Airways Concorde pilots. Uh, it's an elite club, and there's no more senior member of this club than Concorde's chief pilot, Mike Bannister. The computer that controls the position of the ramps was a breakthrough in aviation, the first digital computer. It also was the one thing that the British got right in the development of the aeroplane, the Americans and the Russians couldn't get right. And that's what makes Concorde so efficient and enables us to fly at Mark II without the use of reheats. It's one of the things that, one of the three things that makes the aeroplane function correctly. That's one, the yeah. ability to transfer fuel from the front of the aeroplane to the back to keep it balanced in flight is the second. And the very clever design of the wing that controls the way that the aerodynamic centre of lift moves is the third. I've always wanted to be a pilot ever since I was seven and uh, I went from school straight to pilot training college at Hamble and when I was doing my final exams, that's when I first saw Concorde fly. And I thought that's what I want to do, I want to be a Concorde pilot. Now, I've been in cockpits before and they've been rather disappointing in that they look rather like video games. But this, this is like something out of a documentary my old man's got about Lancaster bombers. <laughs> I mean, it really does feel it really does feel the part. I think it's a great. I mean, one of the reasons there's so much in here is there are so many more systems. Um, the airplanes rather like four airplanes. We fly twice as high, twice as fast. So we've got four times as many systems. The area we've got is a little less because we're at the, the front of a very streamlined body. And thirdly, it was designed, of course, in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And it's a great tribute to the designers. They got it right first time. Nobody's disputing that it was a great engineering achievement, but could they have done anything better? No, I, I, when you think that even today, Concorde is the only aircraft that's capable of flying across the Atlantic at twice the speed of sound. It can fly at Mark II for over three hours. Um, it can get to the edge of space. When the sky gets darker, you can see the curvature of the Earth. It can do all of that in complete luxury for our customers. The only other people that are in that sort of area are wearing spacesuits. They're wearing lounge suits. I know you're a pilot, and with respect, you're not a businessman, but you must have a view on the fact that so much money was spent to get Concorde flying again after the Air France disaster. And then why, why bin it a matter of months later, really? I think it's two separate decisions. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that the decision to put the airplane back in the air was the right one for the right reasons. Uh, when we were doing that piece of work, we looked not only at the safety implications, the modifications that we're doing, but also at the business case for spending £17 million on modifications and £14 million on the new interiors. And that business case stood up very robustly. What we couldn't foresee as we were bringing the aircraft back into service during that period of time was what happened on September the 11th. That happened to be the first route proving flight and the programme to bring the aircraft back. We talked to our customers again, and for the first three to six months of operation, you know, we were doing really well, making good returns, and, and our customers were flying with us. What happened then was a combination of other things, foot and mouth in the UK, SARS worldwide, general economic downturn. In the US in particular, people were traveling less. Generally, people had less money available to spend for, for travel budgets. They were downsizing their companies, looking for cuts here, there, and everywhere. And what we saw was a, a downturn in our premium market. At the time, 
the manufacturers came to us and said over the next two years we're going to need to spend an additional 40 million pound over budget on other engineering and maintenance aspects of Concorde, some of which are not even Concorde related. Um, actually, the physical act of flying it, uh, how how different is that to flying a 747? I mean, she's an absolute delight to fly. You can, you can fly her with your fingertips from takeoff all the way through climb, acceleration, supersonic flight, deceleration, descent and landing. She's very responsive, a bit like a thoroughbred racehorse rather than a riding school hack or a truck rather than a, a, a sports car rather than a truck. And she's an absolute delight to fly and very rewarding too because she can be flown with great precision. And so it's a very rewarding aeroplane for a pilot's point so of view. You can't, it's possible to fly it badly is the obverse of that. Yeah, it is, and that's one of the reasons that at the, the training course to train pilots from other aeroplanes onto Concorde is six months long, whereas a training course onto, say, a 747 is about two and a half months. And that's because there are so many different systems to learn, different forms of aerodynamics, different ways of operating the aeroplane. As Concorde flies supersonically, she's travelling very quickly, and what happens is the air rushes past, and the friction of the air and the compression of the air heat up the fuselage. And in fact, the fuselage it heats up to 127 degrees Celsius, and that's hotter than boiling water at sea level. So the whole thing expands, and it grows between 6 and 10 inches in supersonic flight. Now, fortunately, the designers anticipated that, so throughout the aeroplane, they've put areas of expansion where the aeroplane literally gets bigger as it's hotter and cools again and gets smaller. The only visible one of those is on the flight deck, and it's by the side of the flight engineer's panel, between the engineer's panel and the bulkhead. On the ground, you can't get your fingernail in there. When you're supersonic, you can get your whole hand in there. That gap opens right up. There's a lovely apocryphal story about a pilot on an early test flight putting his cap in there in the supersonic flight, and when they got on the ground, he couldn't get it out. Will you admit ever to have been starstruck by looking over your shoulder and thinking, blimey, there's Her Majesty the Queen or something? I've met some fascinating people. I think that my favourite was Rudolf Noriev. I'm very keen on the ballet. And uh, I met him once. He was travelling on board. And that was in the days when people could come on the flight deck. And he came up and we were chattering away. And it turned out that his idea of the best ballet he'd ever danced was Giselle at Covent Garden, which I'd seen. Uh, it was great amusing that he'd seen me work and I'd seen him work. There's not room for a pirouette in here, though, is there? Well, you, you can if you're very agile, and he yeah. was. It's cosy. I just wonder, 10 or 15 years' time, somebody will decide, well, supersonic air travel, let's get back to it. How will it have to look when that happens? I just can't envisage the human race taking a backward step forever, and I can't envisage my daughter, who's nine, to, talking to her children in the future and saying, do you remember when Grandad used to cross the Atlantic in three hours and 20 minutes and now it always takes eight and a half hours? I'm convinced that there will be a next generation of supersonic flight at some stage. Concord's chief pilot, Mike Bannister. Four years ago, Concord went through a multi-million pound refit. And this is Brightax, where they make the seats for Concorde. And this is how to make an airline seat in 30 seconds. You start with a piece of plastic, might have been used by Rolf Harris, and you put it into a vacuum forming machine by my friend Darren. There you are, Darren. Do your stuff. Chucks it into the machine, forms a vacuum, and it sucks out the shape of the side of the seat. This shows the heat. When it gets to 150, the machine should be ready to actually cause the vacuum. So we're getting up there. And that's the side of the seat. This is a foot fitting. It's where the seat actually gets attached to the aircraft, makes it nice and safe, gets pushed forward here. Here you've got the start of a structure taking place. And right round over here, you've got the pair of seats and really the beginnings of the whole seat taking shape. And this is where they put the cushions and all the other bits and pieces onto that frame. Martin's been working on this seat. It's a British Airways business class seat, which turns into a bed. Very nice. But now back to the drawing board. Uh, we spent months without actually picking up pens and starting drawing, and just talking about what the spirit of it was. Who flew on the plane? Why did they fly on the plane? And we had a number of basic rules. One was the outside of Concorde was beautiful, but inside Concorde it was quite grey. Yeah. I mean, drab it certainly wasn't drab, but it was austere. Mm. And we wanted to bring the outside in, so we wanted to lift the appearance. Uh, you'll see that it actually ended up being heavier than our original intention, yeah. but it's heavy it, it, um, with kind of soft language. You know, it's a very comfortable seat. How much, you talk a lot about weight. How much was weight actual an issue? It's not just the look here, but saying, look, this, this, there are technical requirements. Absolutely. This plane. We, the ambition was to save 20% throughout the aircraft. Wow. And on the seat, 
that would have been bringing it down from sort of 38, roughly 38 kilos down to closer to 30. Um, one of the things that we did was this whole element that forms the kind of basic body of the seat, we made in one piece. We borrowed from the Formula One composite right. industry one piece monocoque in carbon fibre and that was how that seat was produced. The first thing we looked at was an armrest that sat between the two of us that folded inwards nice, isn't it? and then disappeared between the seats. Technically, to produce a comfortable uh, solution, it was just too difficult. So we put that one out right. and we developed this one. And the key feature of this was um, uh, a little mechanism that we produced to go inside here. Um, that, was that was actually now uh, patented by BA. Um, a nice, big, comfortable blade of armrest. And if you, if you hold the mechanism fixed, uh, as it lifts, if you watch, it automatically twists through very 90 nice. degrees and therefore becomes very thin and tucks. And that's the one they've actually used on the plane? And right next door to British Airways, they've got the beginnings of the Virgin upper class seat. I think it'll look a bit better when it's finished. In fact, they make seats for all of the world's major airlines. They've got 55% of the world market in first and business class. They make 5,000 of these seats every single year. And here at this factory in Wales, they employ 650 people. For almost 39 years, I've been involved, one way or another, with this aeroplane, making seats, making yeah. equipment. Well, you're very involved with it now, because your bottom's sat on one, aren't you? <laughs> the, these are the, the latest, well, in fact, the, the final Concorde seats yeah, which this, will ever be made, aren't we? We actually uh, did a full eight ship sets of these seats, um, but only four of them um, met service. So tell me about the process of designing a chair. You get an airy-fairy designer, slaps down a design, and you're the actual guy that's got to make it and make it comfortable. Oh, it's not quite like that. It's a process of getting the engineers trying to translate into what can be produced and how producible it will be from, from the designer schemes in the first place. So you've got to take what the designers are bringing to you uh, to, to put that into an engineering solution in terms of weight, size, packaging, all sorts of aspects. And how long does it take to make a, a seat? Generally speaking, uh, our lead time from original concepts to completion can be about 12 to 14 months. So how much does a seat like this cost? Um, generally speaking... You can tell me. <laughs> generally speaking, that kind of information is very, very secret, Adam. But, yeah. but, I, can but. <laughs> but I can tell you this seat's around about £9,000 uh, for a double. You also make the toilets, don't oh, you? Oh, absolutely. So our company actually makes every lavatory that goes onto an Airbus aircraft. We make 737 lavatories, and we also did the Concorde lavatories as well, the new ones. Now, the, 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 the lavatory in uh, Concorde's very small, though, isn't it? It's, 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 yeah, it's very difficult, uh, yeah. because, again, the diameter of the aircraft make, dictates how yeah. the size of the lav. Adam, you wanted to see the toilet. Now, let me yeah. show you the real one. And right. The, this is the new Concorde toilet. Very unique. It was a Conran and Britax uh, design uh, where we incorporated some of the completely new features that you'd never see in a normal commercial aircraft lavatory. Very first class, very much like a first class hotel in London. If you go into the washrooms in London, this is very similar to the architecture you'll see. It never actually got fitted, though. Never got fitted. But, so why don't you try it yourself yes. and have a look? I will do. Thank you very much. Bit of privacy, then, actually. <laughs> By the way, it's in the door. <laughs> Absolutely awful noise, but it was still beautiful. Still went out in a garden to, uh, to look at it. And also, a uh, Jean Morris, who said, <laughs> Goodbye, Concord. No tears will be shed by me. She says she flew from New York to London in September 1984. Um, she had flu. It really hurt her ears. She was absolutely terrified, especially when the captain explained that bit we saw on the show. He said the whole plane expands 18 inches. She, she envisions herself falling out the bottom of it. She said she was given, um, she was given food and drink from shortly after takeoff. She said, Couldn't eat any of it, so I took my smoked salmon and filled it to stay at home in a clean sick bag. Uh, I couldn't eat it there either, so I gave it to the dog. At least the dog was happy.
Anyway, viewer, um, we've, we've heard from the, uh, the, Concorde, uh, the Concorde cabin crew about what it's like to work on board the plane, but uh, what about the nuts and bolts? When we were filming in the hangar, I grabbed a few words with some, uh, some men in overalls. Yes, they love the plane and all that, but rather furtively and urgently they whispered that it's an absolute nightmare to work on. I pricked my ears up thinking they were trying to tell me it's an old wreck and about to fall out of the sky. Not a bit of it, rather more prosaically. They just said there's such a lot of equipment in such a small place, you physically can't get your spanner in most of the time. Very awkward indeed. Here's what, the, here's what their boss said. It's like getting a quart into a pint pot on a good day. Uh, everything is in very tight areas. Everything is quite complicated to get at. You have to take something out to get at something else. It's uh, a challenging aircraft. So there's no working space. You can't physically get your hands in. On a 747, if you look above the, uh, the ceiling panels, there's about another six feet of space. On the ceiling panels on Concorde, you're lucky if you've got two to three inches above them before you get uh, out to the skin. What's the most awkward job on it? There's loads of awkward jobs on it, and uh, I could start at the front end and I could bring you right the way back to the back end uh, for, for awkward jobs. Everything is restricted, everything is small, you're going through places to get to other places. Engine changes are quite awkward because you have to drop the, you put the equipment on the top of the wing in order to drop the cables through and then disconnect all this section here and all the front section uh, for the, to drop the engine through and then drop it down and then change the parts to put the new engine uh, back up in there. So what troubles me, there's so many little bits, I mean there's this little knot here. That one there, right. Now, who's checking that? Is that checked after every flight? Because when I'm on it, I want it checked. I want every <laughs> nut and bolt checked. There's a schedule of work that is a, a mandatory agreement between ourselves, the manufacturers and the authorities, of what work is carried out on the aircraft and when it is carried out. So, no, that nut and bolt would not be checked, but sure as hell, that nut and bolt is checked when we're changing the engine or as it comes from the manufacturers. Everything will be checked. It's obviously a big part of your life. Will you miss it? Oh, I definitely miss it, but I'll be going on to other challenges and uh, we have other products and we have an uh, innovative company that looks in all sorts of areas um, and uh, there's lots of things for people to get challenges on within the company. It's a very good answer, that. <laughs> Do you think that's kept me job? Yeah, <laughs> yeah got it. have been advised to avoid the area, especially the M25 tomorrow afternoon. Uh, while roads could be gridlocked, it'll be up to the air traffic controllers to ensure the skies are clear, as ever, for the supersonic landing. Anna went to the control tower to meet our working lunch viewer who got in touch with us, who uh, has had a bird's eye view of Concorde every day. Uh, our job is to, um, to safely get the aircraft into and out of the airport, and as expeditiously as possible. We have a limited resource in that we only have two runways here. Um, we have one for departure and one for arrivals. It involves a lot of uh, mental arithmetic. Uh, we're trying to get as many air aeroplanes airborne in as short amount of time as possible. And Otherwise, how are you... they'll just stack up. How are you actually doing that? What's the process you're going through? What we're trying to do is, uh, is get the aircraft started up out of the holding point, onto the runway, in an order by which they'll take off and one will say head south, one will head north, one will go straight ahead, south, north, straight ahead, south, north, straight ahead, and that way we can launch them, as we say, wheels up. So as soon as the nose wheel of the first aircraft is off the ground, we can clear the next one for takeoff. Tell me about the shift you do in the sort of your average day then. How long is the shift? A uh, standard shift is about eight hours long. Um, legally, we're allowed to work for two hours, and then we must have a 30-minute break. At Heathrow, we have a local agreement, which is that we work for one hour, 30 minutes and then we must have a 30 minute break. It takes in the region between two and two and a half years from day one to actually plugging in and talking to the aeroplanes yourself. Uh, the cost is in the region of a third of a million pounds, uh, which is a lot of money, but hopefully uh, I'm worth that. Yeah. Not quite the six million dollar man, but not quite, yeah. the, the third of a million dollar man, <laughs> it's not bad. So what's going through your mind when you're trying to organize the planes leaving Heathrow? There's loads of things to consider. There are heavy aeroplanes and medium aeroplanes. There are fast and there are small. Aircraft have slot times, which have to be adhered to. Um, for instance, a heavy followed by a medium, uh, we have to allow us a certain amount of space because of the vortex wake that leaves the heavy's wing. Concorde is so fast that if we allowed a 747 to take off on the same route as Concorde and then allowed Concorde to take off straight behind it, 
On radar, it would look like a scene from Pac-Man in that Concorde would slowly catch up and eat the one ahead. So we allow a lot of time, that is four minutes, before Concorde even begins to roll. We can use this little mini radar to track them in the first 20 miles of flight. That's the one I've just spoken to. And, he's... and where's Concorde? Oh, he's not on there, he's still on the ground. Speedbird 1, roger out to the Cathay 747 departs. Line up and wait, runway 27 left. Right, this is the strip which controls Concorde. He who has the strip has control of the plane, and it gets passed round air traffic control here. It starts over there, gets sent to movement ground control, and then to Adrian, who actually takes it airborne. It says it's due to fly at 1750. It's heavy, it means it's a big plane. It needs two minutes of separation before another plane can fly. It's flying via Compton, so he knows how to direct it. So if I give it to him, he can make sure it gets off on time. We'll give him a bit of a thrill by letting him line up after Concord. Yeah. That's nice. Savitzieri uh, 313, good evening. Savitzieri 313, after Concord departs, line up runway 27 left. All the pilots are watching Concord, wait for Speedbird 1, the surface wind is 200 degrees at 5 knots. Cleared for takeoff, runway 27 left. OK, he's gone. The tower controlling is very uh, much based around the human. Uh, we need to see what we're doing. And a controller can look out the window, get instantaneous feedback of what is happening, and he's looking and speaking at the same time. And providing him with an electronic display would not enable him to uh, react as fast as the good old human eyeball. I was here. It is the busiest airport in the world, is it? It's certainly the busiest international airport in the world. There are some Amer American airports that are busier than us, but they don't have such a large number of international arrivals and departures. Uh, so how many planes you've got uh, going through the airport every day? Every day it would be 1,350 approximately. That's 460,000 a year. Every day at 7 o'clock, uh, everyone in the tower will stop just for a brief second, just to glance at it and admire it. And after 30 years of service, it still enthralls people, which is a, is a testimony to the people who designed and built it, I think. Full of confidence. Uh, yesterday, we looked at some of the companies who've been involved with Concorde, including those people who designed and built the seats and toilets. And there are some very big names involved in this plane, but there are also some less well-known ones. And the guys at Factory Design, who we featured yesterday, working to point out that they were the designers behind the toilets, a fact of which they are rightly very proud. And, of course, they aren't the only ones. Hundreds of companies have played their part in Concorde, not least the people who make the food for the demanding passengers who pay £7,000 for a return trip to New York. So let's go and have a look at them. Let's begin with me in a hairnet. This is Gate Gourmet, one of the biggest caterers to the airline industry. They make 70,000 meals a day here using 24,000 rashers of bacon, 150,000 kilograms of scrambled eggs and 600 kilograms of mushrooms. They make all sorts of meals, cheap ones for charter flights and more expensive ones as well. But by far and away the most expensive meal they make is the meal they make for Concord. And this is where it starts. Here we've got the raw material. Loads of guinea fowl coming in all raw. Going to be cooked by Mr. O'Fall. Hiya. Hello. So what, what goes on here then? Is uh, they ready to cook seared off now? Don't let me stop you because we've got Concorde passengers waiting. Is it noticeably different doing Concorde cooking to other flights? It's a lot different. It's, uh, it's a lot of responsibility and, uh, and uh, quality we produce. More, is, it, is it a harder, harder job cooking it's it? It's not or? harder, it's uh, like uh, we take care of it, you know. We have to make sure not to overcook. We start 4 o'clock in the morning. 4 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, we what cooking, time do you finish? Quarter past 3 of the, of the afternoon. Right. We're cooking in the morning and same day going on the aircraft. Look at these, real lobsters. Oh, and they're alive and unfortunately they're not going to be very shortly. And I, I, I just can't do that, so I'll let somebody else do that. What are you going to do? I'm going to boil them. You're going to boil yeah, them? Yeah, I'm going to yeah, cook them now. Yes. You horrible man, you. <laughs> oh, down they go. Oh.
Right, this is the fruit carving, but more bizarre than the fruit is that I've just been talking to you two guys. Do they clone you? No, because we were only doing Concord, nothing else. So you do all of the stuff? All of the stuff. Very nice. What are you doing here? We, we do cooking in the morning there, as I mentioned early on. And after that, we do specials, preparation for everything ready. They make ready. you work hard here. We have to work hard. You because have to this work is, hard. Because this is the Concord. You know? This you is talk, the Concord. That's course. the spirit we Of want. course. Right, this is the Concord station. These are all the meals uh, on Concord. Canapes, I always want to say canaps. And anyway, that's how to do it. And here the ladies are laying it out. So what we've got here are the um, lobster cakes, haven't it? With a lobster claw there. And the guinea fowl, which we saw, we saw coming in raw with asparagus. Lovely. Look at that. Lovely chopped carrots and a bit of that's a bit of potato, isn't it? A bit of potato, all the way down here, and oh, lovely king prawns, a bit of egg. Oh, and look at those lemon slices I saw earlier. How very lovely. People talk about food tasting very different in the air and wine tasting very different in the air. Is that a load of baloney? No, no. We've uh, we've actually done some work on this, uh, particularly when I was involved with the wine buying side. And there's 13 conditions we identified that exist in a pressurised cabin that don't exist at ground level. And the potential cumulative effect is to reduce your pallet perception by up to 40%. The interesting thing about Concorde, of course, is that the aircraft uh, cabin pressure, uh, even though it flies uh, an awful lot higher than a normal commercial jet, the cabin is pressurised uh, to a lower height. So, if anything, you could say that food tastes better on Concorde. Right, okay. Well, so what sort of tricks do you have to keep the food fresh? You, you certainly learn as, as, as you go through this business. For, if you're talking about lettuce, there are different styles of lettuce that hold up better than others, and obviously we will use those. But in terms of tricks of the trade, I mean, scrambled eggs is something you might think being reheated on board an aircraft would come back and be horrible, or go all hard, etc. Um, but uh, one of the tricks of the trade here is that you put some bechamel sauce through it, and this makes it really creamy and keeps, it, uh, keeps the texture really good. Uh, sausages as well, I don't want to just keep on breakfast items, but um, the sausages that we use, the director's sausages, they put some honey into the meat mix, and again, that just lifts the flavours really well. What about the menu for the final flight? Do we yes. get an exclusive preview? Of you can actually, it's just gone for sign-off, so it's not definite, definite. But with a seven o'clock takeoff, I think we've really got to go for, for breakfast stroke brunch items. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this the most fantastic supersonic champagne breakfast. We'll do a mixed grill, uh, a prime beef fillet wrapped in pancetta. Um, we'll be doing uh, a wild mushroom and truffle omelette. And we'll be doing lobster fish cakes with a Bloody Mary relish. So can I pick one up? Yeah. yeah. How do you pick? They're, 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 they're not going to nip me, are they? Yeah. No, 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 because they're, they're very oh, tied up. <laughs> Hold it up. From oh, here. Okay. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't your, do it. I, can't. I want to do it. I can't yeah. do it. Hey, hold it. No? No, it's, it's okay. Quite enough for today. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. In the last few minutes, uh, Concorde has taken off from New York en route back to Heathrow. It is for the last time ever. Uh, crowds are already gathering and the roads around the airport are expected to grind to a halt. And while they will be watching from the ground, I got the chance to see how difficult it is to fly the plane when I took control of the Concorde simulator. Well, Concorde is the fastest passenger jet there is. It's cutting-edge technology, but everyone in the back doesn't know anything about it. They're busy sipping champagne and glasses of gin and tonic. The only idea of speed they really get is a, a sort of rather dodgy old LCD display saying number two, Mac 2 on it. All the clever bits, the exciting bits, are up front, where the pilot is, Captain Leslie Brody. And we're about to take off. If we can go, Captain. OK, before we go, Adam, I'll need you to set 250 knots in the speed acquire window for me. OK. And 1,500 feet for our level off attitude, because we're at Shannon for a base training exercise. 250 so set 1500, there, 1,500 on the attitude. OK, to go. everyone's ready. Brakes going off. Three, two, one, now. OK, we're heading down runway Heathrow. What speed are we at? Uh, we're at Shannon, runway 24. And keeping it straight with the rudder bars. Airspeed's increasing. We're already at 70 miles an hour. 100 knots power set. That's 120 miles okay. an hour over 15 seconds. We're drifting. V1. There's the end of the runway. Rotate. We're pulling up. Now, of course, <laughs> that's a great take off. Climb. Gear up. Okay. So, how long does it take to learn how to fly 
uh, Concorde. It takes then. six months. And how long does that compare with flying uh, an Airbus? Well, an Airbus or a Boeing. I'm having take real about trouble. Two or three months. Oh, goodness gracious! Well, you have to concentrate, and because you're talking at the okay. same time, it's uh, more difficult right. to maintain that altitude. So, uh, sorry, right? I'm going to try and get us back to 1,500 feet. That's very good. Okay, just keep talking me through this. I have okay. no idea what I'm doing here. <laughs> you're going to have to decrease the pitch attitude. Is that pull up, push down? Push down. Okay, for this flight, let's talk about pushing up, pushing down, okay? <laughs> okay, we'll push up and push down, but at the moment, that's exactly where you want to be. I'm not sure. You're recovering the situation. You might get another warning. You've got it because you're increasing the rate and descent too much. Okay. But we can increase the, as it's turned, you do pitch up. There you go. Okay. It's a plane which flies faster than anything else, obviously, yeah. and it's cutting edge technology. We're far too. The passengers in the back will be I throwing up. Uh, I think I will take control now before okay. we hit the ground. Oh, take control, take it, take I have it, take control. it. We're going to get a walk, walk, pull up otherwise. There we go. Get me so back. Bring us back down. I'll get you back in the slot again and we'll I'll turn complete. back onto, uh, onto base lane. Where, where, where is the runway? Coming back on the speed. The runway's out to your right. Pull up. And then increase that so as we were destabilised. I didn't get that warning. <laughs> I know I got you in a bad place. Right? <laughs> you got me in a very bad place. How different um, is it to flying, flying other aircraft? It's different from the modern aircraft because the modern aircraft has now got TV screens here. They've got heaters, electronic um, equipment. And what here. difference does that make to actually flying it? Uh, it obviously looks different. The new aircraft types are easier in as much that you've got flight management computers to allow you to um, see where you're going to end up on the rate of descent profile or um, where the route is, you know exactly where you are on a navigation display. This one you have to use your imagination more. You have to take the information from here and convert it into a It doesn't mental do it all model. for you. It no, it doesn't do it for you. No, you have to do it yourself. So I'm going to select the downwind okay. heading in. And I would like you to make a right turn, so you have to bank the aircraft Look, over I'm to level, the right. I'm level. Very nice, just keep it that way. Four seconds, I've been flying this okay. My muscles are so tense. It's actually... That's it, right. It, it's it, not easy, this is not like doing some little video control. It, it's really, you've got to pull this thing, haven't you? Indeed you have. It's for real men is what it I'm is. saying. You have to keep control of the aircraft at all okay, times. We're, we're, very well we're so coming far. up, aren't we? And now we'll make our right turn again to go back towards the airfield to land. Right, but you're not doing anything. Oh, that's because I've used the autopilot at the moment. And, how how uh, much of the flying is actually on autopilot? Uh, we do uh, the super cruises mainly on autopilot, but the takeoff and the landing all fully manual on top. Is it? I mean, it's, it's obviously exciting doing these bits and pieces, but you're flying backwards and uh, forwards across the Atlantic, yeah. mainly on autopilot. Is it boring? Never, never boring. But if you're not doing anything, what do you, you chat well, to your co-pilot about? Well, you do chat, but the, you're also monitoring the aircraft all the time because on this aircraft it's unique. As we go supersonic, the uh, centre of lift that holds you in the air actually moves off because of the aerodynamic effects of the uh, wing. This wing goes from 185 miles an hour to 1,350 miles an hour without changing shape. Right. And to do that, we change the pitch attitude. And in doing so... Which is this, is it? Yeah, this and, is and, the, and that's that, the pitch attitude. That and that's the, the angle of attack I, I, that comes... <laughs> That comes from it. I got the wrong. I only know two of these things, and That's I got right. the wrong. Got them mixed up. I'm, come on, doing it. Keep pushing harder. I don't want to overshoot. Gears up, landing gears to neutral. Further forward. You'll have to go right down to about seven there. You've knocked the pitch bump. There you go. Well done. I think we might have upset the passengers on okay, that one. Okay, doesn't bit. matter. Gave them a bit of a ride. <laughs> Fifty. Lower, lower, 40, lower. 20. I'm, keep pulling back. 15. OK, I'm pulling back. Damn you. Uh, come on, come on. Putting the reverses in. Lower the nose. Stick forward. Brakes on. Brakes on. On top of the pedals. Push hard on I'm those brakes. pushing. I'm, only the right one's going. Oh, I forgot. I've got to steer. Come you on. Steer with your feet. Left, oh. left with your feet, not with this. So where's oh. Steve? 100 knots. I wasn't pressing the right pedal. I have control. I'll bring it to a halt for you. You can relax a little bit now, Adam. I think we'll do some more training. <laughs> First of all, my legs aren't long enough. Ah. Oh. Second of all, it's only when we landed you told me that's how to steer. <laughs>
but we are actually on the wrong way. We are indeed. Well, I don't think you're impressed, but I am. <laughs> well also, done. Don't forget, you'd have a lot more training and you'd go, you'd know how to fly another aircraft type before you came to this. I'm actually sweating, but anyway. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> well done, Adam. Truly the stuff of nightmares. Uh, we couldn't finish our coverage of Concorde's demise without hearing again from the lovely Mary O'Neill. You might remember last Friday we featured Mary finally travelling supersonically. Mary worked on Concorde's wing design back in the 50s for the Royal Aeronautical Society, but she'd never flown the plane and time was obviously running out. But she wrote to us about her connection with the aircraft and Adam was her knight in shining armour. He gave her his ticket. Unfortunately for her, that meant she had to sit next to me. What do you make of the experience of flying on here? It's incredibly smooth. I mean, although it's noisy, it's noisier than I expected. It's incredibly smooth. And that's what, what has really impressed me. Plus the takeoff, which was terrific. Oh, I enjoyed that. That was great. You know, I feel I ought to be making one of those sort of Oscar speeches. Yes. Um, I am speaking on behalf of all the little cogs that contributed to and all the rest of it. But I do feel that. You know, I've been extremely honoured that I'm been able here. to come on, yeah. Yeah. But I mean there are so many other people, there must be thousands. Who made a contribution. Who, who made a contribution and have never got this chance. So how'd you feel? How'd you feel now? Emotional. Good. Emotional. Well, at least we got to see it, didn't we? <laughs> If only you were sat next to Robert De Niro instead of me, that would have made it better, <laughs> wouldn't it? Yep. What a woman. <laughs> what a woman. Last one's on its way from JFK to Heathrow as we speak, arriving later this afternoon with coverage over all the BBC networks, obviously.